Good people. My people. Living blood of ancient Thebes. Why are you gathered here in prayer and submission? The smoke of burning incense chokes the city. Throats are sore with the cries of pain and mourning for the dead. So I've come to you myself. But I would not hear of your troubles through messengers, no. I've come to hear directly from you. So speak! You there, old friend. You're the eldest among these people. Surely you can speak for them. Tell me what it is that preys upon you and know I will do all in my power to help. I'd be blind to misery. I was not moved by such a wretched sight. Great Oedipus, most powerful king of Thebes, you see your people here. Some, such as I, are weary and bent by age, while others are fledglings, barely strong enough to fly. Between them are the valiant and the strong, yet all suffer as one. As you can clearly see, our fair city is sorely beaten down. She cannot raise her head above the storm upon this terrible sea. The people cry out in hunger as disease swallows the fruits of the earth and our meat festers on the hoof. Our women, once strong for birth, abort their children from rotting wombs. An angry god of fire has swooped down upon us, and death alone walks tall among the bloated corpses that litter our streets. All merciful gods abandon us. And so, we pray to you, Oedipus. Yes, we know you are not a god, but you are wise in the ways of God and man. In days gone by, you freed us from the evil sphinx. She no longer feasts upon our flesh, nor binds us in tribute. With the assembled minds of the entire city, we couldn't find a way to free ourselves. It was you alone who found that single word that set us free. Man. And so, we come to you again. We bend to you. We beg of you to rescue us once more from the clutches of evil. I am a priest, and I pray for the deliverance of our people. Yet my prayers fall upon deaf ears. My lord, I have walked this earth for many years. I've seen that men of wisdom and experience can bring an end to suffering. And so I implore you now, Oedipus, you, the best of all men, past or present, to rise above this fearful moment and lift your state from ruin. Act now to enshrine your fame forevermore. Find the remedy or the words to ease the torments that riddle our minds and bodies. Don't let it be said, O Oedipus, that you raised us up only to let us fall. No, restore life to our city, your city, let it stand shining once more. We know you as the man who brought us peace, prosperity, and joy. Be that same man today. Old man, good people, I hear your suffering. I both hear it and see it clearly. But what more is that I feel it? There's not one among you who suffers more than I do. For each man's agony is his own, but every man's agony gathers within me and torments my sleep. I wander these halls night after night alone. Anguish is my only companion. So I've sent for the antidote to the venom that courses through our veins. I've sent Creon, brother to my queen, to Delphi, to learn from the gods what steps I must take to save us. But Creon hasn't returned. We can't imagine why. What could he be up to? But no, whatever his answer may be, I will act swiftly. I'd be a traitor to you all if I failed to act decisively. A timely oath, for here comes Creon now. But pray he brings good fortune. His eyes appear to say as much. Greetings, brother. What news? I bring good news. A great burden will be lifted if we bear it well. These are the words of the Oracle. Tell us more. 
You wish me to tell you here in front of these people? If so, I'm prepared to speak. Yes, speak. These people have suffered long enough. They deserve to hear the news as well as I. And I'll tell you all. The great god Apollo commands us to wipe away an ancient stain upon our land. A festering poison that sickens us all will not be healed until this stain is washed away. What stain? What poison? Our suffering tells us enough, but how are we to cleanse ourselves? In blood. We must atone for a murder. We must either destroy the murderer or drive him from our midst. The blood that stains his hands is a stain upon us all. It is our curse. What man? What murderer? Who's been indicted? Before you came to Thebes, a great king ruled this land. It was Laius. Yes, I've heard of him, but I've never met the man. Indeed, he was assassinated before you arrived. And now Apollo's command is clear. Laius's murderers must be punished, whoever they may be. At first you say murderer, but now you say murderers? Was there more than one assassin? Does any evidence of the crime survive? I need to know more. According to Apollo, the evidence is here. They're all around us. We've simply failed to see it. What's carelessly overlooked most often escapes our view entirely. Tell me where and when Laius was killed. Here in Thebes or on foreign soil? Some years ago, Laius was traveling abroad. On his way to Delphi, in fact, to consult the Oracle. He set out on his journey. He was never seen again. Were there no companions with him? No guards? No witnesses to the crime? All but one of the king's men were killed. The lone survivor returned to give his account. But was so dazed when he arrived, he could only say one thing with any certainty. What one thing? A single word may very well be the key to our troubles. He said they were attacked by a band of thieves. Not just a single man, but a gang. Well, one man or many. Who would dare to attack a king unless he had co-conspirators here among us? At the time, we thought as much. But once Laius was lost, our attention shifted to more pressing concerns. More pressing concerns? Your king had been murdered. Royal blood had been spilled. What could have caused you to leave Laius' murder unavenged? Don't you remember? It was a sphinx. The very beast you saved us from. With her riddle ringing in our ears and her mouth devouring all about her, the murder gradually lost its allure. We set aside the uncertainty surrounding Laius' murder in the interest of escaping the certain death that threatened us all. Very well. Then let us go back to the beginning and shed new light upon this darkness. It's fitting that Apollo be demanding punishment for such a heinous crime. It's fitting that the guilty party be brought to justice. If not for Thebes' sake, then for my own sake as well. Don't you see? Whoever killed Laius may eventually turn his hand against me. In saving Thebes, we save myself as well. You there, good friend. Go into the city. Tell the people to gather here. Tell them I will save them. With the gods' help, this foul deed will rise. Quickly now, friends, let us go. Oedipus has taken on the burden of solving this mystery we've neglected for so long. We've sought his promise, and he's given it. With Apollo's guidance, may he once more be the savior of us all. My mouth is a bitter cauldron. My heart a trembling leaf. My mind is a raging river. My bowels a writhing snake. Great, Great Apollo, Apollo, what dark oracle for thieves? What word of salvation? Afflictions fall from heaven without end. Our plowlands yield no harvest. Our orchards bear no fruit. And mothers cry out in anguish as not a single child survives. Like, like birds on the wind or dancing sparks before a field of fire, my our newborn babes fly swiftly toward the evening shore. The city, the plague rages on, consuming all before it. Ghostly figures ripe with, with the stench of death wander aimlessly stumbling over the carcasses of our fallen children. The plague god smiles. As, As dogs chew upon, upon the once sweet and tender faces of the young. And old gray women prostrate before the altars in one continual wailing of woe. They beat at fallen breasts, clench at brittle hair, and cry out, Hear me! Gods of high Olympus, heal me! Save me! Deliver me from this wanton god of death! I am red! I am raw! I am weary! My, My skin, skin is a fire! My heart 
heart is aflame. My soul is charred and, and blackened. blackened. Great Apollo, God of prophecy and truth, Lord of healing and justice, bathe us in your golden light. Lift us from this well of darkness. Good people, rest assured I will not let you down. Act with purpose as the moment demands, and yet all will be well. This sad story of yours, this terrible tale, though it's an old one, though it was penned before my time here, I will be the one to write its ending and create a just resolution. Though I became one of you after the fact of Lias's murder, it's my duty as your fellow citizen to solve its mysteries. For that reason, I hereby make the solemn proclamation to all Thebans that if any citizen knows by whose hand Laius met his untimely end, I urge that citizen to come forward now with the truth, without fear of repercussions for having withheld evidence against the guilty party. I promise leniency and guarantee that any reluctant witness to the crime may abide here in peace. If this murderer be a foreigner, speak out against him now and I will reward you handsomely. However, if any citizen, in an effort to protect themselves or a friend, chooses to remain silent in the face of my inquiry, that silence will cost you dearly. Do not underestimate my resolve. Therefore, as ruler of Thebes, I forbid any citizen herein to offer comfort or safe harbor to the guilty party. I forbid anyone to speak with, serve with, partner with, or pray with this man. Not even a drink of water shall pass from your hand to his. If this murderer be residing with you now, cast him out into the streets. He is a foul menace. He is the very plague that torments us. Apollo himself clearly stated that this unpunished murderer in our midst is the direct cause of our troubles. I am Apollo's right hand in this matter, which is why I'm acting so decisively on your behalf. Laius was your king, a noble man. And as citizens of Thebes, we are honor-bound to avenge his murder. So I ask of you, all of you, for Apollo's sake, for my sake, for your sake, and for the sake of our sick and dying city, to seek out and expose this corruption now. I have the power to ask this of you, for I am your king. I hold in my hands all that Laius once held dear. His lands, his home, his throne, his bed, and the wife that lies within it. For though they were childless, had he lived, Lyas's son would be brother to my children. And though I never met the man, I will act as his very own flesh and blood. I will act as a son who must avenge the death of his father. I will not relent until I've stopped the hand that stopped his heart. And to men from all lands who would dare to attempt to thwart my execution of these vows, may the gods wither the fruits of the lands upon which they stand and shrivel the wombs of the women upon whom they lie. And for you, good Thebans, and men from all lands who find my actions just, pray for wisdom and guidance from above. Upon my solemn oath, Lord, I testify I did not commit this terrible murder, nor do I know who did. It was Apollo that issued the warrant. Why did he fail to name the culprit? A good question, but surely no mortal man can compel a god to answer. But sire, there may be another way. As long as it leads to justice. Tell me what you're thinking. The man Tiresias, though blind, he's a skilled clairvoyant to Apollo. He may see things our sighted eyes cannot. Yes. Creon spoke of him, which is why I've sent for him. Twice, in fact. But he still hasn't appeared. Why a priest would not answer the call of a king, I don't know. If I may, perhaps it has to do with other rumors surrounding Laius's death. What other rumors? There's an old story that it was travelers, highwaymen, that murdered Laius on the road leading out of Thebes. Yes, I'm aware of the story. No new insight to be offered there, aside from one unreliable witness to the crime. Perhaps your curses will bring him out of hiding, or if he has any sense at all, he'll flee Thebes at once. No. A man bold enough to kill one king surely would not fear the curses of another. <laughs> Quite true. 
Ah, look, Tiresias is coming at last. The killer is still among us. Here is the man to help you catch him. Tiresias, seer, student of mystery, keeper of all secrets. Blind though as you are, you surely see the cruel effects this plague has had on our city. The city is clearly in peril, and only you can help guide us toward salvation. I've sent for you at the behest of Creon, who recently returned from Delphi with an oracle from Apollo, which commands us to scour the city and find those who had murdered Laius. Once found, we either, either to kill them at once or drive them from our city. So I ask of you, use whatever arts of divination, whatever wisdom at your command to help guide me into rooting out this evil in our midst. How dreadful a thing wisdom can be when it brings no reward to the man who possesses it. <laughs> this I knew before I came to you, but failed to act on my better judgment, else I would not have come to bring you any false hope. Why false hope? Why do you deny us any hope? Let me go home. You bear your burden, and I'll bear mine. Trust me, it's better that way. How dare you refuse my request for assistance here? Have you no love for the city that has nurtured you? Would you rather dishonor yourself and leave us in the dark? I command you now to speak. Why should I speak when your own words have no meaning? No. Unlike you, I'll hold my tongue. I have no desire to suffer as you certainly would. Will you to hear my words? You petty man. You clearly know something. Help me. Help us. We'll throw ourselves at your feet if we have to. I can't understand how you- No, you can't. You're ignorant, all of you. So I shut my secrets away. What I know is my private misery. Were I to share it now, it would only add to yours. I'm beginning to grow tired of you and your double talk. You clearly know something, yet you refuse to tell us? Would you rather betray me and destroy our city? I refuse to let you torture me for your own benefit, and so to persist in this interrogation of me is foolish. Save your breath. You've no hope of persuading me to talk. You are an utter disgrace both to yourself and to our city. Squeezing blood from a stone would be easier than squeezing compassion from your flinty heart. Is there no end to your stubbornness? Ironic that you'd blame my flinty heart. Have you examined what beats within your own heart, your own temper. <laughs> You'd be wise to look within yourself before finding fault with me. What man wouldn't be outraged by your words? You're willingly condemning an entire city. No, 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 no. The truth will always find its own path, one way or another. My silence can have no bearing on it. No, it can't. Which is all the more reason why you should tell me now, so we may act quickly to help these poor people. I'll say nothing more. Rage against me as you will. Oh, I will, old man. Believe it. In fact, I'm beginning to believe that maybe you had a hand in killing Laius. Yes, you played your part, didn't you? If you weren't blind, I might conclude you committed the bloody deed yourself. Is that what you really believe? If so, then stand by the very words what you proclaimed and speak to me no more. It's you, Oedipus. You're the festering boil upon this city. You're the plague upon us, the stain! You honestly believe you can get away with speaking to your king that way? I am getting away with it. My truth is stronger than any threats from the likes of you. Beast of a mother taught you to behave so shamefully before a king, to conjure such a hateful prophecy. It wasn't a mother that taught me my craft. You did. I wished to remain silent, but you insisted on provoking me to speech. Yes, speak. I'll ask you again. What are you trying to say? I'm told you're a wise man. If that's true, how can you have failed to understand me? Shall I say it more clearly? Plainly for all to hear? Yes, say what you mean, enough of your double talk. Very well. I'm saying that you are the very man you seek. The blood of Thebes is on your hand. 
That is twice now that you've dared to spit in my face with your treasonous accusations. Once more, and I'll have you punished for your actions. Are you tempting me? Shall I tell you more? Say whatever you like. Your words have no meaning. What I know is that you're as blind as I am. But without seeing it, you're living in darkest sin. The bed in which you sleep is stewed in corruption. You dare to speak to your king this way? Yes, I do, if truth still holds any value. Truth? You don't even know the meaning of the word. Your eyes are only the beginning of your blindness. What a poor, wretched fool you are, to use the very words that one day all men will use to curse you. Pathetic old man. You've clearly lived in endless darkness for far too long. If you feel you could ever harm a man who walks in the light of day. Oh, be assured, I will not be the cause of any harm that comes to you, Oedipus. Apollo will see to that. Your fate is in his hands, not mine. These treasonous accusations of yours. Did Creon put them into your filthy mouth? Or did you fabricate them yourself? Or are you working together? Creon is no threat to you! You brought this trouble upon yourself! Envy is a piteous thing. You're clearly weighted down by it. This power I wield? I didn't ask for it. It was given to me, clearly. The city placed it in my hands. And now, Creon... My friend and brother conspires with a lowly false prophet to overthrow me. A charlatan who's blind when convenient, yet clear of sight when his own best interests are at stake. Tell me, have your conjured visions come anywhere near the truth? When that shrieking bitch, the Sphinx, held our city at ransom, where were you? Did you conjure a single prophecy? Lift a single finger to help these poor people? Your gods, where were they? Your magician's tricks, what good were they? No. Thebes needed a real prophet to set her free. Then along comes a callow youth, a mere adolescent by the name of Oedipus, he was given a simple riddle. A riddle that men twice my age couldn't fathom. And I solved it. I destroyed the Sphinx with a single word. Man. Yes, man. And this is the man you seek to topple? You sightless, pathetic wretch. This is the man you seek to pitch yourself against with designs, no doubt, of standing next to Creon as he sits upon my throne. Well. You and your friend Creon are in for a rude awakening. If you weren't such a pathetic specimen of human flesh, I'd beat you to death with my own naked fists. These two men speak in anger, but, but anger, anger will, will not, not save, save us. us. Oedipus, Tiresias, cease, desist. This war between you will lead to certain defeat where no one is the winner. We, we beg, beg you. you, join forces to carry out the gods' decree. This is all that matters now. This, this is, is the, the matter, matter at hand. Yes, 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 you are indeed a king. But I am not your servant. Every man has a right to speak, and I claim that right here. I don't serve you, nor do I or will I serve Creon. I serve Apollo alone. <laughs> you mock my blindness. Well, that, of course, is your right and privilege. But even this blind man can see what you clearly cannot. Tell me then, oh wise one, what is it that eludes me so? Tell me. Where were you born, oh great king? Who are your father and mother? Who is it that shares your house and bed? In your blindness, you've defiled your own flesh and blood and that blood now stained your hands. A parent's curse lies upon your head, and it will drive you from this land to a land of darkness. No light will touch your eyes. No home will receive you. No one will speak to you. Echoes alone will answer your cries. 
Once you clearly see the familial canal by which you navigated your way into this royal house, you'll realize that your voyage has been doomed from the start. And as you slowly sink into a black abyss, drowning in sin upon sin, the last of your vision will reveal you and your own children as equals. <laughs> So, rage on, Oedipus! Lash out, finish me off! Strike down, Creon, do what you will! None of that destruction will be more wretched than your own. Get this braying ass out of my sight, now! Turn your back from me and go! Pray God I never see your face again. I was summoned! You summoned me! Wouldn't have come otherwise. Yes, but how was I to know you'd come speaking nothing but insurrection? Only to make a fool out of yourself in the bargain. Strange that you think me a fool. Your own parents thought me wise enough. Stop. My parents. What do you know of them? Who were they? Ah, now you insist on hearing what I have to say. Mock my words. This very day, you will see yourself for who and what you really are. And that revelation will destroy you. You're a fraud. Nothing but a self-made master of riddles. Perhaps, but are you not a master of solving them? Finally! You speak the truth! No man can match my skill. Yes, and it's that very skill that'll ruin you. I gladly ruin myself to save my city. Very well. I'll leave you to your ruin. Be gone from my sight. You're now only seeking to distract me from my better purpose. Uh, I'm more than happy to leave you. But before I go, let me tell you why I truly came. I came to face you down and tell you this. All your proclamations, orders, interrogations and threats will come to nothing. They're the distractions. You truly wish to find this man you seek. Look no further, for he is here, now. Though he believes himself a foreigner, he'll soon discover that he is, in fact, a native-born son of Thebes. And then, he'll be blinded by this revelation. Stripped of his sight, his home, his wealth, He'll live out his days in exile, stumbling his way into strange lands. By his children, he'll be called both father and brother. By his mother, he'll be called both husband and son. He'll be forever known as a man who held his father's bride and hands wet with his father's blood. <laughs> well, there now. I've given you another riddle to solve. If in doing so, you find I've spoken falsely. You may further mock my skill in prophecy. <laughs> what man stands accused by this prophecy? What killer's hands have done this savage deed? The time has come for him to run. To move his feet, his horse's hooves, fleeing the gathering storm. Apollo rides the killer's heels, armed with bolts of fire. The gods decree that all join the chase. Through canyons deep and forests dark, the wild beast roams. A fatal sentence stamped in blood upon his hunted brow. Teresius speaks. I hear his words, yet fear their meaning. His words are wilder than the beasts. I trust them not, yet cannot shake them from my ears. Beaten like a bird blown off the horse, my thoughts fly here and there, with no clear path to follow. Apollo is wise, his judgments sound, but what of his prophet? Am I to believe Oedipus guilty on nothing but the words of a blind old man? Do his senses trump my own? No! I must see and hear more. Oedipus was once the savior of Thebes and may be yet again. I, I will stand, stand by him. him! I will not convict without further proof of guilt. For no, no man, man beyond the prophet has ever drenched the hallowed name of Oedipus in, in blood. blood. Citizens of Thebes, I've just heard that our king has leveled serious charges against me. 
scandalous and disturbing allegations that I cannot allow to go unchallenged. So my fellow citizens, I've come to confront Oedipus face to face. If he can clearly demonstrate that through word or deed I've injured him in any way, and may God strike me down, I choose death over dishonor. Why so grave a statement? Because this isn't a private disagreement between men, but a public accusation. One in which I'm being called a traitor to our state, a traitor to you, my fellow citizens. I couldn't hold my head up among you if I didn't answer swiftly and forcefully to these accusations. Perhaps he's merely frustrated and is reacting to the heat of the moment. Perhaps he simply misspoke. Friend, did he or did he not clearly suggest that I conspired with Theresius? That I compelled the old man to spew vicious lies? He did, but I think perhaps he meant to... Condemn me! I'm sorry. Don't ask me to confirm or deny the intentions of the king. Who am I to speak for another? Ah, but I see him coming. Better that you ask him and let him answer for himself. Well, here he is. You have the audacity to show your face in my home? Tell me, Creon. Do you think I'm a fool? I'm too naive to see your plans? Or do you think I'm a coward? Too afraid to fight back against you? Or is it merely that you think all Thebans are traitors like you? That my own people would leave me in the dark as you crept up behind me to steal my crown? Well, you've miscalculated, Creon. You're the only fool here, deceitful, backstabbing coward. I have money, friend, power. You've none of these things. Look around you, Creon. These good people stand here with me. How imprudent and impulsive of you to covet power when you lack the wits, the money, or the influence to attain it. Are you finished? Will you now listen to me? Once you've heard what I have to say, judge me here and now, directly and for yourself, and not through scurrilous gossip and innuendo. I recognize that you're a powerful speaker. But you have nothing to say that I care to hear, for I know what you really are. An insurrectionist and a liar. I deny all these charges and demand a chance to be heard, a chance to acquit myself. You dare to claim your innocence when the evidence of your crime is overwhelming. Evidence? Your argument lacks even the slightest reason or merit. Stop and think about- No, you stop and think! Any man who would dare to sin against king and kinsmen without the fear of reprisal is as thoughtless as a child. Ah, well, finally we agree. You finally said something that makes sense. Now, tell me, calmly if you can, what exactly do you believe I've done to you? Did you, or did you not, persuade me to send for that blind prophet, Tiresias? I did, and I'd do it again. How long has it been since Laius... Since Laius... What? What has Laius got to do with anything? <sighs> Since Laius was ambushed and killed. Oh, it happened a long time ago. It's ancient history. Was Tiresias practicing in the city then? He was, and he was as revered then as he is now. Did he ever mention my name? No, never. At least not in my presence. And Laius' murder was properly investigated? Yes, of course it was. But we found nothing to point to any one man or any group of men for that matter. Why didn't Tiresias speak out against me then? I have no knowledge of that. And when I don't know something, I hold my tongue. Well, you clearly know more than what you're saying. For if you were truly loyal to me, you'd say that- What? If I really do know something, I won't deny it. Tiresias wasn't working with you. If he wasn't working for you, he wouldn't have named me as Laius' murderer. What? He said that. Yes! He said it was I who killed Laius. Well, if that's the charge, then you'd be the one to answer for it. But now I have a question for you. Go ahead. Ask what you like. You won't prove me a murderer. Then answer this. My sister, you're married to her, correct? Yes, of course. Everyone knows that. And you and Jocasta, rule Thebes as equals? We do. And I'm the third equal to you both? Indeed. Which is why your disloyalty is so rank. Then swallow your rage for a moment and think. 
ask yourself, why would I want your position? Why would I prefer to live under the strain of power when I could simply enjoy its benefits? Trust me when I say I have no desire to be king. Power only wants its privileges. Everything I need, I already have. Why then would I ever exchange my freedom from responsibility for slavery to it? Think, I have all the influence of a crown without the weight of it. I'm already the envy of all, why then would I be envious of you? A wise man has no appetite for treason. He knows not to upset a perfect balance. But if you still don't believe me, if you want direct proof, go to Delphi yourself. Ask the Oracle if the words I brought back to you are his or mine. Do that, Oedipus. And if you still find even the slightest trace of my treachery, then arrest me and have me summarily put to death. I'll second your judgment. But don't hurl accusations at me or condemn me without a shred of evidence. A charge so weighty deserves more than mere guesswork. Don't simply jump to conclusions only to mistake a good man for a bad one. To cast away a true friend is to cast away life itself. There is nothing so precious as a loyal companion. Therefore, give this matter the time it deserves. For only time can separate this righteous man from the villain you believe me to be. For a man under duress, he's very well spoken, Oedipus. It might be wise to withhold judgment for now. Maybe. But a nimble conspirator demands a nimble prosecutor. To suspend is to stall. If I stall, his plan succeeds. My plan? What is it you want, to banish me from Thebes? I want your blood. I want to make an example out of you. I need to make an example out of you. So, you refuse to listen to reason. You've already passed judgment on me. Yes. There's nothing you can say to earn back my trust. For a man so often praised for his wisdom, you're clearly demonstrating very little of it here. I'm wise enough to know when to protect my own best interests. Perhaps, but as a leader, as my leader, you should be protecting my interests as well. Protect you! You're evil incarnate! And what if you're wrong? Have you considered that? Rulers must rule. Not if they rule badly. Oh, Thebes, my city! Thebes is my city too, not yours alone. It belongs to all of us citizens. My lords, please be still. I see Jocasta coming in just in time. With her guidance, perhaps you can bring this quarrel to a resolution. You poor, foolish men. Why are you arguing my petulant children? The public good stands in peril, and yet you occupy yourselves with a private quarrel? Husband, come inside the house. And you, brother, return to yours. Let go of whatever it is that threatens to destroy the love between you. Let go? Sister. At the very least, your husband intends to banish me from my father's country, or if given his preference, to arrest me and have me put to death. Indeed, my lady, your brother conspired against me. He's plotted to overthrow me and seize control of the city. May I be damned if I ever wished you any harm. Oedipus, in the name of God, trust Creon in this. For my sake and the sake of these people here, listen to him. My lord, I beg of you, Please listen to your queen. Then what would you have me do? Take Creon at his word. He's never deceived you in the past. You're well aware of what you're asking of me. I am. Very well, continue. My lord, you are accusing a man who until now has been a loyal friend to you. Before you dishonor Creon and the friendship you've shared so many years, be sure in your accusation. So? You would have me destroyed, too. Are you part of this conspiracy? No. Let me die and be damned, friendless and godless, if I ever entertain such a thought. No. It's for my city I speak, for the crops that shrivel and rot, for the people that wither and fall. Would you add bad blood to the burden we already bear? Very well. Let him go, and have me killed or banished from Thebes. You are my people. You are my true family. You will forever have my heart. 
Creon is my sworn enemy. He will forever have my hatred. What a sad, ugly, and bitter forgiveness that is. It's not me, Oedipus. I'm not the villain here. Your own temper is your worst enemy. Why are you still here? Very well. I'll leave now. But know this. You may not see it, but in the eyes of all these people, you've just thrown away an honorable friend. Good lady, would you please escort our king inside now? Yes, of course. But first, explain to me what's happened here. Accusations were made without evidence, provoking anger and resentment, as gossip is wont to do. On both sides? Yes. What exactly was said? Our country is already on its knees. Please don't pick at that scab, my lady. Please leave it alone. Leave it alone? It was you who brought me this news in the first place. My head was clear until you tugged at my heart. My lord, as I have said repeatedly, I would be a fool if I didn't stand with you. You, the trusted pilot who steered our ship of state through storms of old. So I implore you now, Oedipus, put aside your rage and be that steady hand once more. Your attention needs to be on that, not some grudge with Creon. Yes, Oedipus. What's distracted and blinded you from the greater crisis at hand? What anger has diverted you from the responsibility that you have to these people? Your brother has conspired against me. What did he say that has angered you so? He claims I am the one who has killed Laius. Leave us. Is it Creon alone that accuses you? No, he's using that blind prophet as his twisted mouthpiece. Listen to me, Oedipus, and let me put your mind at ease. No matter what Tiresias has said, no man has a skill of prophecy. If you don't believe me, I'll prove it to you. King Elias once received an oracle, not from Apollo himself, but from his minions. This oracle foretold that Laius would die at the hands of a child born of his own flesh, and mine. But that oracle was obviously a lie. You've heard the story yourself. Laius was killed by strangers, foreigners, at a place where three roads meet. But long before that happened, before our child was even three days old, Laius pierced and bound his feet, placed him in a servant's hand, and ordered that my baby our young son be left to die alone on a mountain rock. So, Apollo's fateful oracle never came to pass. It wasn't the son who killed his father, but the father that killed his newborn son. Don't you see? The gods don't trade in dark and murky prophecy. They trade in clarity and light. Strange. What? Your words were meant to comfort me. Instead, they conjure a shadowy memory that... That what? Uh, what do you mean, a memory? Uh, a memory of what? Just now, you said that Laius was killed in a place where three roads meet. Yes, that's the story. Where was this exactly? At a place called Focus, where the Theban road forks either for Delphi or Dahlia. When exactly was he killed? Shortly before you came to Thebes. By the gods. What web are they weaving to ensnare me thus? Oedipus, what's troubling you? No, no questions. My head is spinning. Tell me, what sort of man was Laius? How tall? How old? Tell me exactly. He was a sturdy, handsome man. His hair just touched with white. His build was not unlike your own. From my own mouth, no less, Jocasta. I may have damned myself. What? What are you saying? Oedipus, you're frightening me! I'm frightening myself. It may very well be that this blind prophet has the gift of second sight after all. But tell me. Tell you what? Although I'm afraid of what you may ask, I'll tell you all I know. Exactly how many men were in Laius's entourage when he died? Five, including a herald. 
Lias rode in a single chariot. May God help me, it's becoming all too clear to me now. But who told you? About the attack? A servant, the only one to escape. He came here afterward and recounted the events. Here? Yes, and when he returned and saw that you had taken Lias' place, he begged me to send him away to work as a shepherd in the fields. I granted his wish, of course. He'd earned it after what he'd been through. The shepherd? Can he be recalled here quickly? Yes, certainly. But why? I may be just speaking out loud. May have already said too much. But I need to see this man before me soon. Consider it done. I'll summon him at once. But as your wife, I deserve your trust and confidence. What's this all about? Very well, Jocasta. Who better to be privy to my inner thoughts than you? There are things about me, about my past, that you've never known. My father was Polybus of Corinth. My mother, Merope, a Dorian. As a youth in Corinth, I was well known for my wit. And in time, I was known as the finest mind in the city. However, something strange happened. Something seemingly small at first, but it left me shaken nonetheless. One night, at a public gathering, a drunken man approached me and began to shout at me, claiming that I was a bastard. I wasn't my father's son. At first, I restrained myself, for, for it was well known that this man was a drunkard prone to gossip. However, his words still affected me, for I loved my parents deeply, and the thought of me not being their child made my heart ache. So the next day, I approached my parents, my mother and my father, this story, and I held my breath as I awaited their answer. They were furious. This man had publicly insulted me and slandered their good names. First, I felt relief at their answer. However, the seeds of doubt had been planted deeply, both in my mind and in the minds of others. First, it started as just whispers, heady gossip in alleyways. But it eventually grew into open talk in the streets. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't shut my ears to it. So I set out for Delphi, alone, in search of answers. But when I arrived, Apollo dismissed my question without a response. Instead, he spoke of things. Horrible, monstrous things. He said that I would one day rise up and with my own hands slay my father. What's worse is that I would join my mother in her bed, and from that unholy union would spring forth a race of beasts from which all men would have to avert their eyes in disgust. Upon hearing that, I fled. I decided to never step foot in Corinth again. I thought by distancing myself from my parents, I might forestall the prophecy. From that day forward, Corinth became a memory, a blind spot beneath distant stars, a land beyond the horizon best forgotten. I wandered long and far into strange countries, eventually arriving in a place where, as you say, three roads meet. And then, <clears throat> and then, <sighs> I'm sorry, I can't. Go on. You must get this out into the light. Very well. As I was traveling across a lonely tract of land, I happened to a place where, as you say, three roads meet. I came upon a procession of men, the center of which was a horse-drawn carriage, a kingly man and his servant perched within it. As the carriage approached, it suddenly lurched towards me, its occupants attempting to drive me from the road. Reacting instinctively, I reached up and I struck the servant. At this, the old man produced a horsewhip and lashed me soundly across the face and back. However, the old man made a fatal error. For as the horses started at the commotion, he had to avert his eyes briefly to steady them. And in that instant, I grabbed the horsewhip hoisted myself into the chariot, 
wrapped the horse whip around the old man's neck, and I dragged him from the cart. And once he was grounded, I proceeded to pound his head into the rocky earth while I bashed him across the face with the heavy handle of the whip. When he lies still, I set upon the others, who had been stunned into inaction, swinging my bloody fists to and fro until every man lay torn and lifeless beneath the sun. I stood above them, my chest heaving in a blind rage. I killed them all. You killed? Yes. And so, Jocasta, if these men were indeed from Thebes, and if this man was indeed Lias, show me a more miserable man than I. Show me a soul more despised by the gods. Think of it. This murderer must be cast out of every good home, must be shunned, spat upon. I've decreed it. And what's worse, these hands. These hands that have pulled your body close to mine in hunger for your love, have broken your husband's body in hatred. So what am I? Ravenous beast beyond redemption? Am I to be driven from Thebes at once? But where am I to go? I'm a man without a home. I can't return to Corinth to kill Polybus. And, and what of us? If I can't return to your marriage bed, am I to return home to enter the incestuous bed of my mother? No! I would rather disappear from the sights of men than to find myself stained in the blood of my father's heart and steeped in the blood of my mother's womb. Buried alive in an unholy fate. My lord, your words are chilling, but cling to hope until the messenger you've sent for has come and spoken to you. He was there and may prove your version of the events as a different memory altogether. You're right. There still is some hope. Surely his witness to the events will give you some chance of peace. What do you hope you'll say? I hope his account of the murder will match your own. What specifically did I say that would make you think so? You said that the shepherd or servant claimed that Lias was killed by a band of thieves. If he sticks with his story, then I am safe. Clearly one man is not many. Rest assured, the whole city heard him say as much. He can't change his story now, and even if he did, he can't prove your guilt. He can't prove the truth of the prophecy that was delivered to us along with our newborn son. What do you mean, the prophecy? A prophecy that said that Laius would die at the hands of an infant son. His infant son, born from me. Don't you see? This could never have happened. For that poor thing was left in the barren hills long before Laius was killed. No. Put no stock in oracles, my love. They're as false as Dicer's oaths. An obsession of simple minds. That may be true. But send for this man anyway can't continue to live in agonizing doubt. Nor should you have to. I'll send for him straight away. But come inside now. Lie down with me. Rest your mind. This will soon be settled. Come. There now. Shh. Let me put my faith in fate. Let me follow destiny's path. Let me be reverent in the way of God. Let me be faithful to the laws of heaven. Born on high, a child of the cool blue firmament. No earthly mind can see the laws. Their memory is timeless, deathless. They shall not be slaves to mortal sleep. The laws contain a mighty living God, a God that will always remember, a God that will never grow old. Pride nursed as a tyrant, filling his belly with conceit. Beware the man of ambition. Hubris is the hand fight that pulls it high. If the hand of the deity is strong.
strongest in all vanity. God smites the swollen head of man. May God reward the healthy hand that labors to the while, while striking, striking down, down the prideful hand that reaches after the laurel. For the proud profanes the sacred, but I am fearful since foresight sightless at their king command. Is fate a lie, unworthy of the wise? Good priest, my husband's not himself. Obsessed with oracles and omens, overwhelmed with prophecies and propaganda, he can't see his way to truth. He can't hear the voice of reason, but rather listens to anything that speaks of doom. I can do nothing more to sway him. He won't listen to what I have to say. My words break upon the gates of his ears like glass upon stone. Will you pray for him? Pray to Apollo to deliver our king from this iron grip of misery and fear? For we are as passengers on a ship whose captain cowers below decks while the storm rages above. My friends, I wonder if you would be so kind to show me to the home of Oedipus, or better yet, to the man himself? His home is here, stranger. The king is resting at the moment, but this is the queen wife and mother to his children. Blessings upon you, noble lady, and upon your husband and your home. And blessings upon you, stranger. But tell us now why you've come. Does some news accompany your gracious greeting? Yes, my lady. I bring good news for both your house and husband. What news is that? Where have you come from? From Corinth. The news I bring will give you great joy, a joy tinged with grief. What is this news you bring to us? How can it bring both joy and grief? The people of Corinth call upon Oedipus to be their king. I don't understand. Doesn't old Polybus rule in Corinth? No, King Polybus is dead. This is, of course, the painful part of my news. Polybus dead? Yes, and strike me dead as well if I speak not the truth. Ugh! Where are you now, you oracles and prophecies? Oedipus been wrapped by your ridiculous lies for years, cutting all ties from his own father for fear of destroying him. And now this father has been cut down by fate and not by the hand of his son? Jocasta, what is this commotion? I was woken from a sound and much needed sleep. Oedipus, listen. Listen to the news this man brings to you and then tell me again about truth and prophecy. Who are you? What news do you bring? He comes from Corinth. He brings news of your father's death. Is this true? Polybus is dead? Yes, my lord. Your father Polybus, king of Corinth, is dead. But how? Is it treason? Disease? Tell me exactly how he died. When a man is as old as Polybus, a little thing will put him in his grave. Then it was illness that took him. That and time. He was very old. <laughs> Why? Why have I wasted my time listening to this mindless Delphic chatter? May as well have been listening to the cries of shrieking birds above my head. These messengers spoke of bloody hands and incestuous sheets. Yet Polybus lies buried in Corinth while I stand here in Thebes. I wasn't his executioner, as he died from grief of my departure. These prophecies are but empty words, to be fittingly buried with the dead. You see, my love, didn't I say that very thing this morning? You did. Thank you. I'm sorry fear got the better of me. It did, but no more. Put all of this nonsense out of your mind forever. But my mother's bed. What if there is still a chance? No! Stop! Now tell me, should a man whose life is ruled by chance live in fear? Doesn't this messenger's news clearly prove that nothing can be foretold? Live in the moment of life, Oedipus. Trust only what you can see and touch. Have no more fear of your mother. For many men in dreams have shared their mother's bed, but dreams are only that. They can't harm a man once he's opened his eyes to the light of day. What you say is true. However, my mother is not a dream. She's alive. And as long as she still lives, this is a nightmare from which I cannot shake. 
But still, this messenger's news has brought you some measure of peace, hasn't it? It has. As a matter of fact, uh, pardon me, my lord. This woman you speak of, who is she? Merope. Merope, the queen. Why should you fear her? There's a dark prophecy that binds us both together. Years ago in Delphi, Apollo said that one day, rise up and slay my father. It's worse. I would couple with my mother. When I heard that, I vowed to never set foot in Corinth again. And to this day, I have happily brought no harm to either parent. But I have missed them dearly. It would be comforting to see their faces one last time before they died. And it was this fear of harming them that drove you from Corinth? Yes. Would you see me kill my father and top my mother? No, of course not, my lord. But aren't you reassured by the news that I bring? Does it not give you hope? If only I could be reassured. I'd happily reward you for any news you bring. I must confess, this is the reason I've come. To find myself in your good graces when you assume power in Corinth. No, I'll never return to Corinth. I, but my lord, I, forgive me for saying so, but clearly you've no idea what you're doing. What am I? Well, don't mince your words, man. What are you trying to say? My lord, if these are the reasons that you've refused to return to Corinth, then I'm sorry to be the one to inform you of this, but they're empty of reason altogether. Can't you see these fears of yours are groundless? How are they groundless? Spit it out! Oedipus, Polybus was not your natural father. Not my... What are you trying to say, man? Polybus was no more your father than I am. But you're no blood to me. Of course not, and neither was he. Then why did he call me his son? Because many years ago, I gave you to him as a gift. You gave? Yes. But how did my parents love me the way they did if I wasn't their child? Because they were otherwise childless and they needed an heir and he had only you to love. This is absurd. How did you come to give me to Polybus? What, did you buy me or did you... I found you in a canyon on Mount Cathira. You found me? What were you doing up there? Tending sheep. A wandering shepherd! Now I've heard everything. Yes, my lord, just a simple man, but your savior nonetheless. How? What do you mean? Your feet should tell you that. Yes. Wounds from a childhood injury, but why would you bring that up now? When I found you, your feet had been pierced and bound together. I cut you free of your bindings. Yes. I've had the scars as long as I can remember. It was those scars that gave you your name, did they not? Oedipus, swollen foot. But why? Why was I bound? Was it my mother or father who did this to me? Answer me! I'm sorry. I don't know the answer to that. But the man who gave you to me certainly would. You just said you found me, so you didn't just stumble upon me? No. Another man gave you to me. Another man? By the gods, this story has more layers than an onion! Who was he? Another shepherd like you? No, not a shepherd. He was a servant in the House of Lias. The House of Lias? As in this house here? Yes, he had mentioned he was one of the king's servants. Have any of you seen the man this shepherd mentions? Either in the city or in the pastures? It's about time things were made clear to me. If I'm not mistaken, my lord, the man you seek is the same man you've already sent for. Jocasta could clarify that for you. Isn't that correct? Jocasta, is this true? Is the man we sent for the very one the shepherd mentions? Why is a noble and wise king standing here listening to the silly story of a lowly shepherd? What? You would simply have me ignore all this when I'm on the verge of discovering the mystery of my birth? How many times must I say this, Oedipus? Enough! If you care about your own life or mine, let it rest now! I'm begging you! Why? What do you have to be afraid of? Even if my mother was a slave born to slaves, there's no shame in that for you. Oedipus, listen to me! I'm pleading with you. Stop what you're doing and resist this path you're being led down! No, no! I must discover who I am no matter where the path leads me! Stop! Please! 
Can't you see? I'm trying to protect you. Protect me? Protect me from what? I need no such protection. I warn you, my husband, my king, only doom awaits you. May you never discover who you truly are. Silence! Someone bring this mystery man to me at once. My wife is clearly afraid that she's paired up with a peasant. I want to see her face as I revel in the truth of my birth. Oh, you miserable man. I have no other words for you now or ever. Oedipus, why is the queen so distraught? A and now this vow of silence she's taken. Oh, I fear some monstrous thing may come of it. Let it come. No matter how base my birth, I must know who I am. My wife is of a royal line. Her blood is pure. Perhaps she sees my peasant's blood as shameful, unclean. Well, I was a son born of chance. Luck is my mother. The faces of the moon are my brothers, bringing with them both kindness and cruelty in equal measure. Why should I be afraid of the nature of my birth? Why should I want to be any man than who I really am? O oh, Cathiron, great shelter in mountain, sacred guardian of our king! What cruel mortal left this child upon your gentle ground? What kind mortal heard his cry and swaddled him in native green? Or was it gods conceived and bore this child upon your native flanks? We, we seek only answers. We seek only truth. Good priest. I believe I see the servant we've so eagerly awaited. Yes, my king. I know this man. He was once a trusted servant in this very house. Stranger. Is this the very man you've mentioned? Yes, this is the very man. Old man, come here. Don't look at the ground, look at me. Good. Now I have some questions for you that I want you to answer honestly. You have no reason to fear the truth. Do you understand? Yes, my lord. Now, were you ever a servant in this house here, the house of Elias? Yes, my lord. I was born a slave here in this house and grew up here. And what sort of work did you do for Lias? Well, most of my life I was a shepherd, Lias' flock. And in what regions did you tend to Lias' flock? Sometimes Kithiron, or the hills thereabouts. And do you ever remember seeing this man about the pastures of Kithiron? This man here? Yes. Do you recognize him? Recollect ever meeting him? No, no, I... Don't recall seeing this man, nor do I ever recall meeting him. Is that the truth? It may very well be, my lord. This was many years ago. Let me try to refresh his memory. My friend, do you remember when we each spent several summers together on Kathiron? I had one flock and you had two, do you remember? And each autumn we would each go our separate ways and drive our flocks down to the pasture lands below? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, of course, but uh, forgive me, I'm, I'm old and my memory is not what it used to be. I understand. But do you remember the time that you gave me a child, a baby boy, to raise as my own? What? W w what if I did? Why, why bring that up now? Look here. This man, this king, was once that very same baby boy. Oh, damn you. Damn you, shut your mouth! Enough! It's your words that concern me, old man, not his. But, but my lord, what, what have I done wrong? You haven't answered his question about the child you gave him. Oh, but his questions are meaningless, trying to stir up trouble, loosening his tongue to make himself seem important. Perhaps you better loosen your own tongue. Or if you won't speak willingly, we can devise other methods. You would torture an old man? In a heartbeat. You there, twist his arm behind him. Uh, no, no, wait, wait, no, wait, what, what, what do you want to know? Did you, or did you not, give this man an infant boy? I did. I wish to God that I had died that very day. You'll die this very day, unless you're honest with me. My lord, if I'm honest, then I am better off dead. This old man's wasted enough of my time. 
Take him away. No, wait, no, wait, please, please. I, I, I already told you. I, I gave this man the boy. Where'd you get him from? From your own house or the house of another? Answer me. I, I, he, he wasn't mine. Some, someone else gave him to me. Who was this man? Do you see him here now? Please, please, my lord, no more questions. I'm, I, I'm just a weak old man. You'll be a dead old man unless you start to answer my questions. Very well. Very well. The boy came from this house. The house of Lias. Good. Was he a slave child or of royal blood? My lord, please. Please, you. I'm on the verge of a monstrous truth. That and I'm on the verge of hearing it. The boy was the son of Lias. And who was the man who gave you this boy? It wasn't a man, my lord. It was your wife, Jocasta. It was she who placed the baby in my arms. My wife did this? Yes, my lord. But why? Why would she? She told me to take the boy into the wilderness and... and kill him. My wife did this to her own son, but why? She was frightened, my lord. There, there'd been a prophecy. What kind of prophecy? A bloody one. It was said that the boy would one day kill Laius, his own father. You disobeyed the queen. You brought him here instead. Yes. Why? I pitied the helpless child, my lord. His, his little feet were pierced and bound, and, and I'd been given orders to kill him. But I just couldn't bring myself to follow those orders. So I thought this man could take the boy away from thieves, take him back to his home country, and no one would be the wiser. And he did. He saved the boy. Saved him for an unspeakable fate. For if you are that boy, now a man, Oedipus, then no man is more cursed than you. Lost. At long last, it's all been made clear. Ah. Uh, 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 uh! Damned in birth, damned in bed, damned in blood. Oh, 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 oh. true happiness. Who recognizes truth from illusion? I cast my eyes upon the fate of a wretched Oedipus, a soul now torn asunder. Whose doom is darker than that of Oedipus? Who suffers greater anguish? Who wrestles greater torment? torment? Eyes of time outshine the eyes of man. And cast the piercing light of truth upon things unholy. Time judges now this monstrous union where mother and bride are one. Alas for fallen Oedipus, our, our sorrow is beyond all words. Yet from our mouths we pour this cry. Oh, that we had never seen your face. Oh, that we had never shared your blindness. People of Thebes, what horrors you will see and hear. What grief will weigh upon you. No river could cleanse away the stain upon this house. Not even the Nile itself could wash away the filth and shame. A great evil lies within this house. An evil not unconscious, but willful. Alas, the greatest pain that we endure, we bring upon ourselves. We suffer enough already, man. What further pain must we endure? It would appear that one more thing has been added to our woes. The queen, Jocasta, is dead. Jocasta? Dead? By whose hand? 
Her own. You cannot imagine the chamber of horrors within. Thank God you were spared this terrible sight. But to my horror, I was not, and with great reluctance will tell you what I saw. Once the queen left us here, she ran throughout the house in a wild panic, tearing at her hair, clawing at her face. And then, upon reaching her private chamber, she quickly locked herself away. But from behind the great doors, we heard the queen cry out the name of Laius. Then, in an anguish so ferocious, all about were gripped with fear. A great wailing pierced the halls as she screamed and cursed herself a wretch who bore a race of monsters. Bridegroom by a husband, offspring by a son. Then, as her greater wailing pierced the halls, her voice was choked, and then all fell silent. And then what? You must tell us all you saw, no matter how painful. Very well. Moments later, Oedipus burst into the palace, screaming, demanding a sword to wield upon the queen, as he meant to harm her. When no man obliged him, some terrible force of rage took hold of him. As he threw his weight against the bolted doors, broke the locks, stumbled into the chamber within, and, and there... And there what? And there... Above the ungodly marriage bed, Jocasta's lifeless body swayed, suspended by a massive twisted cordage that she tied about her neck. Upon seeing the sight of his dangling woman, she, who had been both his lover and mother, a great heaving sob escaped the king. As he loosened the cord around her neck, lowered her onto the bed, and enfolded her into his own arms. That can't be the end of the story. What did you witness next? We must know what happened. What happened next was terrifying beyond all words. Wrenching at her garments, the king tore free the golden brooches that were once Jocasta's, and raising them high above his upturned face, he gouged the pointed tips deep within his eyes, and shouted out, no more shall you gaze upon the horrors which you have brought me. No more shall you gaze upon my shame. From this day, go forth in darkness, blind to what you never should have known, blind to those you never should have seen. Gasping, we looked upon his face as he continued to strike at his eyes with savage hands, each thrust unleashing a torrent of gore that gushed from the ragged of sockets. Finally, his fury spent, the king collapsed onto the bed, blood soaking the sheets between him and his strangled queen. So from this ghastly too, this evil has emerged. Not one is cursed, but man and wife, mother and son. Where is Oedipus now? He's in there now, asking for someone to guide his steps so that all may look upon him. Once all have seen him, he intends to tear himself from the heart of Thebes so that we may finally be free from this curse at last. But he's weak, and he lacks a set of eyes to guide his steps. But none within can guide him, for to look upon his face is to look upon a depth of torment that even a nemesis would pity. But look now, for here he comes. Oh, what a wretched sight to behold! Never have my eyes seen a thing so hideous! Oh, oh Oedipus, tell, tell us! What, what madness overcame you? What, what monsters feed upon your mind? We cannot bear to look upon your face, so we would speak to you! The sight of you halts our tongues, steals our breath, clutches our beating hearts! Oh, God. God. What have you done to leave me so deserted and darkened? Oh, fate. Fate, when will I be rid of the terrible memory of this day? Alas, Oedipus, we fear that fate now leads you to a bitter end. Oh, clouds of darkness that envelop me never to pass. You crashed down upon me like a wave and swept away the light of my former fortune. 
the pain that floods these lifeless eyes echoes the pain that pierces my soul. But is it not just that the pain in your soul should mirror that of your flesh? Ah. I know that voice. Is that you, old friend? Still standing by to offer patient counsel. Oh, you reckless man! What demon drove you to tear away your sight? It was Apollo. It was his hand that stripped away my world and cast me into darkness. But the hand that took these eyes, that was mine. Mine alone. What good are eyes when all they look out upon is a man's own disgrace? True enough. Yes. And what's left of me now? Love? Companionship? Even the joy of a gentle touch? A warm greeting, a tender voice? No. All that's left of me now is the solitary beating of my own heart, keeping in tempo in a world of darkness, ruin, ashes, and dust. Abandoned in your mind as you've been abandoned by the gods. Oedipus? I wish I'd never known you! <laughs> yes! Damn that man who unbound my feet and robbed me of a quiet death on that lonely hillside. If I had only died as an infant, I wouldn't have grown into the monster that I am. If only. Yes. If. If! Perhaps it would have been better if you'd taken your life today instead of your eyes. No. If I still had my eyes in these empty sockets, how could I ever face my parents as I entered the land of the dead? No. My blindness is a just punishment. A noose around the neck or a dagger at the heart would be too easy. My only regret is that in stealing away my sight, I can't stifle my hearing as well. I can only stop it at the source. I can lock away my misery in a sightless, soundless abyss, free from the plague of memory. But here I am, bearer of a dark legacy, born of a wicked breed, a race of rabid mongrels, a pack of incestuous dogs. But I'll say no more. Come, friend. Lead me away. Kill me. Cast me into the ocean or take me to some far lonely place, free from the sight of other men. Take my hand. No. I've no authority to do as you ask. But Creon is here. He's now the sole protector of Thebes, and he alone is fit to judge what steps should be taken. But what will I say to Creon? After what I've accused him of, after I've denounced him. Oedipus! I haven't come here to mock or blame you. You there. You've no respect for human dignity. Respect at least Apollo, Lord of the Sun. Don't leave this pathetic wretch here to profane the light of day. Take him into the palace at once. No, Creon, please, I beg of you. Give me what I asked for. I do it for your sake and for the sake of Thebes. Not my own sake that I ask for it. What is it you ask for? Drive me from Thebes as quickly as possible. Banish me to a place where I can live out my days free from the sight of other men. That's exactly what I want to do. But I'll wait until I'm sure of what God wants me to do. But God's will is clear. Don't you remember the oracle? Kill the evil at once or banish it from Thebes. I am that evil. Yes, that's what the Oracle said. But I, unlike others, want to be certain. Creon, I beg of you, don't delay in this. First, give that woman in there a proper burial. She's your sister and deserves as much. Then let me go from this place. Don't allow the city to continue to suffer on my account. Purge my father's kingdom of the evil I brought to it. Take me to Cathiron, the place my parents chose as my tomb, and let me die there, alone, 
and forgotten. In time, that will be done. My daughters. What's to become of my daughters? They're far too young to fend for themselves. Look after them for me, Creon, as if they were your own. As wretched as they are, they're still your flesh and blood. But first, let me touch them. For to touch them is to see them one last time. What's this? Do I hear the sound of my daughter's weeping? Have you pitied me, Creon, and sent for them? I sent for them. Bless you. My God show you kindness that he's never shown me. My precious ones, come to me. Clasp your brother's hands that have taken your father's eyes. It's only with these hands that I can see you now. If I could restore my eyes, I, I, I'd weep for you. When I think of the bitter lives that you'll lead, it, it, it stops my heart. Creon, I'll ask you again. Raise these two innocent children as if they were your own. They're young and tender and have no friend but you. Give me your hand on this. Bless you. My loves, as you are young, I will offer you this one simple piece of advice. Take whatever steps you can to live the happy lives that your father and brother never did. Enough! Girls, back to the palace. And you, stop your weeping and get out of my sight. I will. Though it pains me to do so. Time will ease that pain. Now go! But promise me, Creon, that you'll banish me from Thebes. No, that's a promise only God can make. But God despises me! Yes, so he should grant you your wish. Are you certain? Only God can be certain. But I wouldn't tell you what I didn't believe myself. Then stand up for what you believe in and send me from this place now! Silence! Who are you to command me? You are no longer master here, Oedipus. I am. But remember, when you were, you were master of nothing but your own terrible fate.